This is Louis Francois, co-founder and CTO at Towards AI, where we give industry trainings and build courses for everything AI related. I had the pleasure to attend GTC in person this year, and I went to Jensen's quantum panel with 14 leaders in the field. And it was the coolest event I went at GTC. Pun intended with the coolest, since quantum computers literally need to be cooled near absolute zero. Anyways, with all my time spent in AI, quantum has always felt a bit abstract and hype. Yep, even for someone in AI, with everything from generative AI to agentic AI or whatever in between, quantum still feels even more hyped without actually delivering. As Jensen said it so well, there's almost a one-to-one -one breakthrough to controversy ratio in that field. Just like Majorana One's recent Microsoft huge breakthrough, where are the actual results and industry use? Why do we see all this hype but no actual follow-ups? The promises are that quantum computing could fundamentally change what's possible in science and technology. The real excitement around quantum is its potential to tackle problems that are simply impossible for today's most powerful supercomputers, like accurately simulating complex molecules, materials, or biological processes. And such advances could lead to breakthroughs in developing new medicines, creating better materials for batteries, or finding more efficient ways to generate clean energy. It could even help us understand fundamental physics more deeply, revealing insights about the universe at its smallest scales. Quantum computers might also accelerate progress in AI by generating highly precise data to train models or solving optimization tasks that currently take massive computing resources. So despite all these exciting promises, quantum computing often seems shrouded in hype and confusion. This panel, however, actually helped me cut through some of that noise, and so I wanted to share some bits from it. But first, I have a very interesting sponsor for this video to present you, Language. Language is an open source LLMOps platform focused on quality control and DSPI visualization. It allows teams to track, monitor, and evaluate LLM applications to ensure quality and detect issues. Language empowers our human in the loop domain experts to analyze conversations and annotate improvements easily, while developers can debug, build datasets, guardrails, quality assurance, and refine prompts with a single click using automated optimization tools like this. It also features over 50 LLM specific evaluators and enables the most important part of your pipeline, the creation of custom evaluations through studio workflows to capture the precise quality metrics that you actually need. And just as important, it also offers business level conversation metrics, user and quality analytics for monitoring and cost tracking. Language supports DSPI experiments and provides super useful tools for continuous product improvement. Try out Language today for free with the first link in the description. Now, before we get to it, to be clear, I still don't completely understand everything happening in the quantum space. I'm not a quantum expert at all, and I will love input from any experts on these. But here are some valuable insights I took away after the panel and with some more research on my own, including many deep researches. So what's my biggest takeaway? It's that quantum computing isn't about replacing your computers anytime soon. It's about specialized hardware, what we would call QPUs, tackling specific tasks alongside classical processors. Just like GPUs are added to computers as an additional chip along with a CPU, QPUs, or quantum processors, could be a third option for some very specific use cases. Just like we use GPUs for gaming and AI. The challenge is that even quantum computing experts aren't yet certain about the best practical use cases for quantum processors, or QPUs. But there's an even bigger obstacle actually building reliable quantum hardware. And when it comes to making these chips usable, there are two major problems. First, it's what we call the quantum error correction. Quantum chips regularly produce calculation mistakes, or errors, because qubits, the fundamental units of quantum information that can represent multiple states simultaneously, are extremely fragile. They easily lose their delicate quantum properties, a process called decoherence, when exposed to tiny environmental disturbances like heat, vibrations, or electromagnetic interference. Without robust error correction techniques, quantum computations quickly become unreliable. To solve this, quantum computing relies on the concept of logical qubits. 
an abstract unit of quantum information encoded across many physical qubits. Experts estimate that it currently takes about 100 physical qubits working together to reliably represent just one logical qubit, dramatically increasing the complexity and size of quantum computers. This enormous overhead highlights just how challenging it is to scale quantum systems while maintaining accuracy and precise control. The second problem is this scalability. Today's largest quantum computers still have only dozens to a few hundred qubits, far short of the thousands or even millions needed to tackle real-world problems like simulating complex molecules or optimizing large-scale logistics. Adding more qubits isn't as straightforward as adding transistors to a classical chip. Every qubit must be precisely controlled, individually wired, and carefully shielded from interference. As the system grows, complexity skyrockets. For example, in certain superconducting quantum processors, each individual qubit requires multiple dedicated wires, sometimes up to 5 per qubit, to provide precise control signals. At that rate, a quantum system with a million qubits will demand millions of wires, creating massive engineering and reliability challenges. And what about the solutions to these two problems from the 14 CEOs of leading companies? We don't know. Yep, there's no one clear path forward. They are currently exploring how to tackle these problems, but also for what quantum processors could be actually used for. This makes it quite a unique field. From the 14 companies in the panel, some of them were trying entirely different methods for stacking qubits, mitigating these errors, and making the global system work. One approach uses superconducting circuits, which requires being cooled down to temperatures close to absolute zero just millikelvins above. At these incredibly cold temperatures, superconducting circuits can tap into quantum properties making techniques like quantum annealing possible. This method is especially good at solving optimization problems like finding the most efficient routes or solutions from countless possibilities. However, superconducting systems aren't very flexible for general purpose computing tasks and face significant hurdles around noise, errors, and scalability. Companies like D-Wave and Rigetti are prominent examples of those using this approach. Another completely different method involves trapped ions manipulated by lasers. Here, individual charged atoms ions, are held in place with electromagnetic fields inside ultra-high vacuum chambers. Lasers then precisely control and interact with these ions to perform quantum calculations. A big advantage of this approach is that it operates at near room temperature and achieves very high accuracy and fidelity. The main challenge, though, is scaling. As the number of ions grows, controlling them accurately becomes increasingly complex. IonQ and Continuum are two leading companies working on this technology. There's also a promising third approach. Neutral atoms are held in optical traps and carefully arranged using laser beams, creating dynamic qubits structures. This approach also operates at room temperature thanks to laser cooling techniques and has exciting potential when it comes to scalability, potentially handling thousands or even more qubits. However, it's still relatively early days for neutral atom quantum computing with companies like Pascal and Qera actively working on developments in this area. And finally, a very different and still theoretical approach is known as topological quantum computing. This method aims to overcome the noise and error problems faced by other approaches by using exotic particles called Majorana fermions. Unlike conventional qubits, topological qubits store information in a way that's inherently protected against errors. It's almost like tying a knot in a rope, no matter how much you shake it or move it around, the knot remains intact. This built-in protection could significantly simplify error correction and improve reliability. However, there's a catch, no one has yet conclusively demonstrated a functioning topological qubit in practice. Microsoft is one of the major players actively researching this promising yet challenging approach with their new breakthrough research that recently came out. And there are other approaches. In short, multiple approaches are advancing simultaneously, each tackling quantum computing's challenges from different angles. And there's no consensus yet on where to go next but they all expect to have one of the directions to come on top of the others as we advance one discovery at a time. Just like how in the mid-90s, the graphics industry debated between two approaches, the quadratic texture mapping and the triangle-based rendering. 
NVIDIA's first product, the NV1, utilized quadratic texture mapping, aligning with Sega's approach. However, it seemed to be the wrong choice, and it almost went out of business. As industry standards and research evolved, triangle-based rendering clearly became dominant, leading NVIDIA to shift technologies for all following products. And so we are about at the same moment in Quantum trying to figure out what to do next. And what about NVIDIA here? Interestingly, NVIDIA's role isn't to build quantum computers directly. They stick with GPUs. But instead, they are creating a research center in Boston to help integrate quantum processors with AI-driven classical supercomputers. Think of GPUs and CPUs doing the heavy lifting while QPUs handle specialized quantum tasks. So what are these tasks that quantum systems could tackle? As I said, even the experts don't know yet. They gave examples of using QPUs for generating labeled data for training AI systems, mostly for biology, physics, or material science. After researching a bit, I got that quantum processors can natively simulate complex quantum systems, capturing effects like superposition and entanglement that we often hear, which classical GPUs can only approximate with significant simplifications. This means QPUs can generate higher fidelity, more accurate labeled data, especially for tasks in quantum chemistry, biology, and material science, where true quantum behavior is essential. And quantum behavior here refers to the unique ways particles act according to the laws of quantum mechanics. For example, superposition allows a qubit to exist in a combination of 0 and 1 simultaneously and entanglement links the state of one qubit to another, regardless of the distance between both. These behaviors produce quantum effects. Measurable outcomes such as precise energy levels of electron, their probability distributions, and interference patterns in a molecule. In other words, when a quantum processor simulates a system, it directly captures these intrinsic quantum interactions rather than relying on classical approximations. This results in high fidelity data, accurate labels like energy states or reaction probabilities that can be used to train AI models for applications in chemistry, biology, and material science. If you didn't get that completely, don't worry. It's all honestly still a bit unclear and abstract to me too, even after a few deep researches. So I'd love to know if anyone more knowledgeable in the field have any comments or corrections to bring to that video. One of the companies on the panel, Infection, took a super interesting approach to the problem, trying to first commercialize simpler quantum technologies, like highly precise quantum-based clocks and sensors, to validate their technology. Their strategy is to gradually refine the core technology through practical, lower-risk products before scaling up to more complex quantum processors. This helps them bridge the gap between quantum theory and real-world usefulness and might point to how quantum companies can find their footing even before the ultimate quantum use cases become clear. Again, mainly to improve upon what exists and not replace computers. This is just like what Nvidia did with first tackling the video game industry where the stakes were lower. Nobody minded a few dropped frames or missing pixels in a game which allowed them to gradually scale up their GPUs into powerful tools used widely today, from AI and autonomous vehicles to scientific research, all by mainly adding benefits to existing technologies with no downsides. Quantum computing might similarly need to find a practical stepping stone industry to grow and mature. So despite all the buzz, quantum computing today feels like AI was a decade ago. Lots of potential, tons of uncertainty, and a big open question, or more, about what applications will truly matter. This isn't surprising, though. Every major technology, from the internet to electricity, faced the same skepticism at first. Even classical computers initially had unclear use cases. Early on, they were mainly employed for specialized military applications like precisely calculating missile trajectories during wartime long before becoming the general purpose devices we use today. It always takes time to understand these new paradigms and uncover the practical applications where new technologies can truly shine. Quantum computing will likely follow a similar path, gradually transitioning from hype to specialized tasks and then to broader uses. I'm starting to get a bit more interested in quantum, not for its hype, but simply for the complexity of the task and to better understand how it works. What about you? 
Are you bullish or skeptical about quantum computing's near-term impact? I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. And also, if any of you have some quantum expertise, please let me know and give me your feedback on the video or if you have any interesting information about any topics I covered in here. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.